was baptised in the Holy Spirit in August 1985. I remember it as if it was yesterday. I was 11 years old and sat before me were two people who prayed with me to ask Jesus to baptise me into the promised gift of the Holy Spirit. Nothing major happened like tongues of fire or earthquakes. I didn't get a dove that swooped down and sat on my shoulder. I didn't really notice anything physical except that I spoke in tongues. I remember how I felt. It was like I was seeing everything in colour for the first time. In some way, I was different. I fell passionately in love with the Holy Spirit. And when I look over my life before I was baptised in the Holy Spirit, I can see how the Holy Spirit was at work in my life up to that moment. It was when I received the Holy Spirit was the moment I stepped into the full potential of all that God had for me. It was the beginning for me in learning how to hear God and, and being equipped to live obediently in him. I started getting prophetic words and visions. I did not instantly become a perfect Christian, but for me, the Holy Spirit worked gently within me, gently changing me from within, challenging, provoking me to be more like Christ. I had increasing I had an increasing burning desire to live my life, the gospel, to make sacrifices of wanting to serve God like Christ. Although it wasn't really a sacrifice because the Holy Spirit was at work in my heart and my desires of what I wanted in life became more Christ-centred and less Judith-centred. I can honestly say I've experienced firsthand God's patience, love and kindness all the days of my life. I've on my heart today to talk to you about the Holy Spirit, the promised gift. It's the first of a two-part series and I'm so excited to share with you this wonderful person. I'm really praying that even as I speak, that only your, not only your understanding is deepened, but your desire for him is strengthened, your awareness of his presence is clearer. I'm praying for that for me too. Many of us listening to this will be in very different places of, of what we know and understand and um, even experience of the Holy Spirit. Wherever you are at, open your heart to what the Spirit of God will reveal to you afresh about himself. I've heard some people say that the Holy Spirit and all that spiritual stuff isn't for them. The Bible is all that they need to know God and, and know how to live. I've heard people say that it's for preachers or the prophets or evangelists. I've heard people say that it's not for me today. I've even heard people say, if it makes you do wacky things, it's not really for me. It can be hard to imagine the Holy Spirit as a person. We find it easy to think about Jesus as a son and it's not difficult to think about a father whose arms are open towards us. But thinking about the Holy Spirit as a person can be more challenging. What we think about the Holy Spirit is important because it will affect our relationship with him, how we respond to him, how much we are aware of him. What we think about the Holy Spirit will affect how we worship, pray and witness. You may have accepted Christ as Lord of your life, but have you been baptised in the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is an essential part of our Christian life. The Holy Spirit is vital even when reading the Bible. Without the Holy Spirit, the Bible is lifeless. The Holy Spirit brings the pages of the Bible alive and makes it part of us. The experience of the Holy Spirit isn't just for those wacky, quirky Christians. The experience of the Holy Spirit is for all of us. And he will never do anything that will embarrass you or make you do something embarrassing. He may challenge you to think outside of the box and see yourself as he sees you. He will give you boldness to step into things that you would not normally have the confidence for. The Holy Spirit is not merely an empowerment for the teachers and preachers and the evangelists, but he is your divine teacher. For every single one of you who are baptised in the Holy Spirit, he will speak directly into your heart, teaching you and equipping you. John 14 verse 26 says this, 
but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I've said to you. If you want wisdom, a greater understanding of God and life and the universe and your place in this universe, baptism of the Holy Spirit is the gift ready and available for you to simply ask for. The prophet Joel prophesied that a day will come when he will restore all things and at that time the Holy Spirit will be poured out. The timing was key for the outpouring and Jesus first had to come and restore all things by making a way for us to come to the Father. Once Jesus had done this, the day foretold by Joel came and the Holy Spirit was poured out on all who came to Jesus. The promised gift that generations before Jesus could only have hoped for. And we read in Acts about that day arriving, the moment the promise is fulfilled. The Holy Spirit is poured out on all people to prophesy and do the works of the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit. So let's turn to Acts, Acts 2 verse 1 to 20. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a, the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. At that time, staying in Jerusalem were God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Now that's what I call the time of God. Every God-fearing Jew from every nation happened to be in Jerusalem at the precise time when the outpouring of the Holy Spirit came. You know, God is always put in opportunities for you to be in the right place at the right time so that you would experience him. Verse 6. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Then the book of Acts then lists about 15 different languages that were spoken that day. Verse 11. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Now, we may be in the right place at the right time to experience God, to see what he is doing. Sometimes some things can seem a bit strange to us, even when we experience God. If it's a bit strange, it can affect how we respond, how we feel, especially if it's uncomfortable. Who would you be in the story if you were amongst those witnessing something this strange? Would you ridicule, criticise and, and try to make sense of it by downplaying it? Or would you open your heart in wonder, ready to allow the Holy Spirit to help you to understand the awesomeness of it? Let's pick this back up in verse 14. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show you wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
People are in wonder and amazement because they're hearing the wonders of God being declared in their own language. Peter is like, what is happening right here in your midst is the great, is the gift that was promised to us through the prophet Joel. Peter continues this time, he reminds them of David's prophecy by reciting Psalms to them. So in Acts 2, 25, it continues, David said this, about him. I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. David is prophesying about Jesus' dependency on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was central to Jesus being born, living his life, doing miracles, going, going to the cross and being raised from the dead. The Holy Spirit was the one who made sending Jesus into the world happen. Jesus enters into our world by the power of the Holy Spirit by coming upon the womb of a virgin. Jesus, being human, relies on the Holy Spirit in all that he does while here on earth. All the miracles and signs and wonders, Jesus attributes to the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was always before him. And we too can continually know the joy in his presence. It is for you to have a relationship and dependency upon the Lord, Holy Spirit, in the same way as Jesus. Jesus was confident that the Holy Spirit who gave him life in this world would not abandon him to the realm of the dead. And it is, as we know, that it was the Holy Spirit who brought him back from the grave. The Jews listening to Peter understood in their hearts this to be true. So they responded by asking, what should they do to also receive the promised gift? In 38, Peter replies, repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. My challenge to you today is to long for more of the Holy Spirit in your life and to be baptised into the Holy Spirit, which is different to being baptised in water. What's stopping you from receiving the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in your life? In the same way Jesus depended on the Holy Spirit, we can too. The Bible shows us that the Holy Spirit was around since the beginning of time, bringing light and life wherever he goes. He first gets a mention in Genesis at the time of creation. In Genesis 1 verse 2, it says this, Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The Holy Spirit was hovering over the waters. He played a part in creation, making all that is formless, empty and dark into something wonderful, beautiful and fruitful. This is what the Holy Spirit does. He makes anything that is formless, empty and dark into something wonderful and fruitful. That's what happens in our own lives too. One theologian describes them as someone who makes a house into a home. In any part of your life, circumstances or experience, the Holy Spirit is the bringer of light and life and will make it fruitful, will make you his home if you let him. Psalm 36 verse 9 says, For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. He is the life giver. As well as life giver to us and the world, he is our Lord. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 17. Now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. The Holy Spirit is God in exactly the same way and to the same extent as the Father and the Son. Everything that God does is done by the Father in the Son, through the Holy Spirit. 
It's so important for us to understand that there isn't a hierarchy of Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And sometimes to get our head around God, we can simplify it by using our earthly wisdom and understanding, thinking that there must be someone who's in charge. We can mistakenly think that if Jesus is sent, then he is in a lower rank to the Father. Well, Jesus sent the Spirit, so he must be in a lower rank to Jesus and the Father. If we don't understand that Father, Jesus and the Holy Spirit are one God, but three distinct persons, and everything else we understand about God can be skew-withy, distorted. It does seem like there's a lot of sending going on though. The Father sends the Son. The Spirit makes it happen. The Father sends the Spirit. And the Son makes it possible for us to receive him. There is no inferiority, but rather a community of power. What a beautiful image, a community of power. And we get to be part of that community. You are part of that community of power because once you have received the power of the Holy Spirit, you are also sent on the mission of God. Being baptised in the Holy Spirit is not a tick box for Christians. It's so that you can have power to be a Christian. We need him to fulfil the mission on our lives. Every single child of God was never meant to be without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Acts 1 verse 8 says, We will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on us so we can fulfil the mission of God. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. In this life, we need the Holy Spirit. There is no son or daughter exempt from this promise. The Holy Spirit is Lord. He's your promised gift who will make your life fruitful, purposeful and powerful. He's our Lord and he deserves to be worshipped, honoured, adored, listened to and keeping in step with. If you want to be baptised in the Holy Spirit, ask Jesus to baptise you. Or if you find it more helpful, ask someone to pray with you. If you already have been baptised in the Holy Spirit, maybe you could open your heart to whatever he is doing. Ask him to speak to you, to fill you afresh. Is this your moment to respond to the gift? God bless you. Bye-bye.